Today on Brief History, we take a look at perhaps the most famous and arguably the most adored English king in the history of the monarchy. A man whose very name would be intertwined with myth and legend and whose legacy would conjure in the minds of many the idea of bravery and chivalry. But is this adoration well deserved or were his accomplishments perhaps exaggerated? Join me as I take a brief look at Le Coeur de Lyon, Richard I of England, Lionheart. Richard was born on September 8, 1157, at Beaumont Palace in Oxford, England. He was the son of King Henry II of England, known as Henry Kurtmantle or Henry Plantagenet, and Eleanor of Aquitaine. He was the fourth eldest child of eight children and had four brothers, three of which survived to adulthood, Henry, Joffrey, and John. His eldest brother William died young and thus made him the second eldest surviving son behind his brother Henry. His father was about to be declared as heir to the Kingdom of England after a long bloody civil war between his grandmother, Empress Matilda, and his grandmother's cousin, King Stephen of Blois. The war had been raging for many years, and Stephen had seized the throne upon Richard's great-grandfather, Henry I's death. His grandmother, Matilda, who had been declared as heir, fought for her right for the throne after Stephen's usurpation. She eventually had passed the torch to Richard's father to continue the fight. By the time Richard was born, his father was already Duke of Anjou, Maine, and Normandy, with Anjou being the family seat, and King Stephen designated Richard's father as heir to the throne after his own son died. Stephen would also himself soon die, making Richard's father King of England in 1154. Prior to Richard's father's ascension to the English throne, he had married Richard's mother, Eleanor, Duchess of Aquitaine, in 1152, after she had divorced her prior husband, King Louis VII of France. This put into Richard's father's possession the vast lands of the Duchy of Aquitaine, in addition to all the other lands stated before, making him one of the most powerful kings in Europe at the time. Richard's mother and father were very different in personality. His father was a very talented statesman and military leader, valuing practicality and utility. He was the son of a former German empress who had a cold, calculated worldview and was focused on administration and political control. Richard's mother, Eleanor, however, was raised in the cultured and romantic Duchy of Aquitaine, known for its support of the fine arts and dedication to the ideas of chivalry, music, love, and legend. Although the marriage between Richard's father and mother were fruitful early on, eventually they grew apart, with Eleanor traveling back to Aquitaine on the continent. Richard may have been born in England, but he and his brothers were to be raised in their mother's court in Aquitaine, while their father fought to re-establish the power of the crown after the end of the Civil War. Richard was said to have been a favorite of his mother, and in his childhood he would have instilled in him the foundation for what would become his idea of what a highborn man should be, chivalric, brave, and glory-seeking. Although these qualities may have positively influenced how he is viewed both in a modern and historical sense, it would not affect how his father viewed or treated him, and he, along with his brothers, would have a monumental task in front of them in regards to fighting for power with their extremely influential and powerful father. By the time Richard had become a young adult, his elder brother Henry, known as the Young King, had been coronated as co-ruler with their father. This was done to guarantee a smooth succession when their father died and was a procedure that had been done in France as well. Young Henry, angered by the lack of power allowed by their father, began to rebel and allied himself with his father-in-law, the King of France, Louis VII. Louis was all too happy to forge an alliance with his longtime rival's son and attempt to corrupt his father's kingship from the inside out. Richard had been designated as Duke of Aquitaine at 15 years old, but he too had little tangible control due to his father's unwillingness to release any degree of power to anyone, including his sons. Encouraged by his mother, Richard backed his brother young Henry, but young Henry and Louis were eventually defeated by Richard's father, and both he and his brother were eventually forgiven. 
Their mother, on the other hand, was quasi-imprisoned for her involvement in the rebellion. This would not be the end of the family rivalry, however. In fact, Richard would find himself fighting against his brother, young Henry, when he was in his 20s. This was brought on by the fact that Richard refused to pay homage to young Henry due to outstanding disputes between the two. Their brother Joffrey, who had become the Duke of Brittany, sided with young Henry, but their father would eventually intervene on the side of Richard. Together with his father, Richard steadily defeated his brothers, eventually laying siege to them at Limoges. His brothers feigned surrender and escaped to begin plundering Richard's lands, but young Henry would become ill with dysentery shortly thereafter and died in June 1183. With the death of his brother, Richard suddenly became heir to the throne of England, and his father wished to limit his power and control. His youngest brother John was becoming older, and his father attempted to seize the Duchy of Aquitan to hand over to John, but Richard would not submit to this. His mother was released from her imprisonment, and Richard was forced to hand over the Duchy to her, the rightful owner, as the lords and the people of Aquitan preferred Eleanor's rule to Richard's due to his harsh suppression of rebellions in her absence. But eventually, Richard would form an alliance with the new king of France, Philip II, known as Philip Augustus, who was crowned after his father Louis VII died. Richard's father was in his late 50s by that time and was suffering from multiple ailments, including a bleeding ulcer. After battling his father and failing to come to terms at a peace conference, Richard and his French allies struck quickly, catching his father off guard at Le Mans. Richard would set fire to the part of the city outside of the walls, with favorable winds blowing the fire within the walls and causing his father to flee and eventually sue for peace. His father would have to make difficult peace negotiations and give up valuable lands, something that he had worked his entire life trying to prevent. It was said that when his father gave him the kiss of peace after submitting to the demands, he grabbed Richard firmly, stating, May God grant that I may not die until I have had my vengeance on you. But fortunately for Richard, his father would not live long enough to have any type of vengeance. The old king retired to Chinon, where his condition deteriorated, and on July 6th, 1189, he died and was taken to Fontefroy Abbey. Richard was said to have visited his father one last time at Fontefroy, quickly entering, viewing his father, and leaving just as quickly as he came. King Henry II was one of the great medieval kings of the era, and Richard would have a substantial task ahead of him in regards to keeping hold of the vast lands attained by his father. But the world would soon see that Richard was much different than his father, bound by the ideology of chivalry and bravery indoctrinated within him during his childhood. His reign would be focused less on the worldly wars of kings and lords, and more focused on the wars of God and the Holy Land. After the death of his father, Richard headed to England in August and on September 3, 1189, in a magnificent and grandiose coronation, he was crowned as King Richard I of England just five days before his 32nd birthday. At this point, we must take a step back and look at Richard from an aggregate standpoint to truly understand the legend and myth surrounding him, as well as the reasoning behind his decision making after his coronation. There are two conflicting views of Richard that have arisen and persisted through current day. The first view is that he was one of the greatest English kings to rule England, mainly due to his nature, being brave and chivalrous, but also due to his great military and political accomplishments. His nickname, Lionheart, or Cœur de Lion in French, was already being used during his lifetime to describe him, and is still used to current day. There is no doubt that Richard was a spectacular warrior, and his bravery and military accomplishments should not be understated. He was an absolute force to be reckoned with, and he commanded much respect in his time as leader. However, in that time, many of the record keepers of history were churchmen, and so men who were defenders or allies of the church, which Richard would no doubt become, were many times viewed positively or perhaps had their triumphs exaggerated or glorified. Some kings in the past who actively looked to subjugate or oppress the church and its power, King William Rufus being the first one that comes to mind, found themselves described and remembered more harshly. As we will see, Richard would become almost exclusively tied to the pursuits of the church, thus giving his reputation a leg up from the start. When all would be said and done, Richard would spend less than six months of his reign in England, using its resources and treasury to fund the pursuits we will soon discuss in a faraway land. He was quoted as stating that he would sell London if he could find a buyer, and being raised in his mother's household in Accuton, 
Richard was more closely tied to the nobility on the continent rather than those in England. Some believe that he valued his holdings on the continent over his English lands, with the exception that England brought with it a kingship, but we will see that his actions perhaps allude to the fact that this was not true. Also, his upbringing instilled in him the ideals of chivalry and bravery, almost to a fault. We will see that he often took daring risks, even in unnecessary circumstances, in the name of glory, which in the end would end up leading to his demise. For these reasons, some say that the myth surrounding Richard is unfounded and not proper when viewing from the lens of the crown of England. But in order to form an opinion on one of these viewpoints, we must also look at the reasoning behind Richard's choices after his coronation. In 1099, the First Crusade conquered the Holy Land of Jerusalem in the name of Christianity. This was overtly and abjectly glorified and seen as a miraculous work of God awarding Christians for their devotion and dedication. This greatly influenced the leading men of Richard's day, but in 1187, during the reign of Richard's father, the Holy Land was retaken by the Kurdish Sultan Saladin. The Pope had called for a subsequent crusade which Richard's father, Henry II, and brother, Henry the Young King, agreed to answer by taking the cross, although his father and brother would die before they had the chance to fulfill their vows. By the time Richard was an adult, taking the cross was commonplace, if not a social requirement for the leading kings and nobles in order to not be seen as a coward. In addition, taking the cross had other non-worldly benefits. Many kings and nobles lived a life of war involved in the slaying of men and armies against the backdrop of the dog-eat-dog -dog world known as medieval life. Because of this, they also simultaneously lived a life of sin. Agreeing to take the cross to defend the Holy Land in the name of Christianity was a form of penance, absolving those who engage in war of their worldly sins, which was very appealing to men who believed their souls at risk for their transgressions. Lastly, success in the Holy Land would almost guarantee glory both at home and around the world on an unprecedented level. The glorification of the First Crusade was no coincidence, and attaining the same level of success could catapult one's glory to similar levels of those they once admired. Understanding these influences, historical glorification of previous Crusades, Crusade engagement by his family members, social pressure, absolution of sins, and unprecedented glory, one can start to see why Richard chose to do what he did. In 1187, Pope Gregory VIII, who would die only two months after becoming Pope, called for the Third Crusade after the Sultan Saladin reconquered Jerusalem, as stated previously. It was said that Richard was the first nobleman north of the Alps to take the cross and was soon followed by many other leading nobles, including King Philip Augustus of France. Contrary to what some believe, he did not use England only as a source for funding this endeavor, simply bleeding the treasury dry and siphoning income to be directed to the crusade. Instead, he began the process of raising money for said endeavors, but being careful not to disrupt the integrity of the kingdom, and in fact, seemed to be setting up the kingdom for his long absence. His father, although dying before being able to fulfill his crusade oath, had instituted a tax known as the Saladin Tithe on goods within the realm for the purpose of raising money himself. Richard simply continued this practice, but also started auctioning off lands and positions, which came to include castles, earldoms, and sheriffdoms to add to the tax. This had its desired effect, and within a year, Richard had raised a substantial amount of money. Richard did not appear to be disinterested in making sure the kingdom remained properly governed and peaceful in his absence. He personally negotiated a compromise between the Archbishop of Canterbury, Baldwin, and the Benedictine monks of the cathedral's priory, which had a long-running dispute that had been going on for some time prior to Richard's ascension. In addition, he filled all church offices that were vacant at the time, which included the sees of London, Winchester, Worcester, and York. In York specifically, Richard installed his half-brother Joffrey as archbishop, who could have been a major source of rebellion should he have been ignored prior to Richard's departure. He attempted to do something similar for his younger brother John by extending the county of Mortain to him in Normandy, along with other castles and lands in England. This would give John substantial income, but in return, Richard required that John swear an oath to stay out of England for three years. It was obvious that Richard did not trust John, and the events that were to follow would prove his suspicion to be well-founded. In regards to leadership, Richard appointed William Longchamp as justiciar, along with four other co-justiciars, to rule over England. In addition, his mother, Queen Eleanor, was to oversee administration of not only England with the justiciars, 
but the entire realm as a whole, including his lands on the continent. Lastly, he forged alliances with William the Lion in Scotland and beefed up his Welsh defenses before orchestrating a simultaneous departure for the Holy Land with Philip Augustus of France, preventing Philip from being able to make strategic moves against the kingdom were he to part earlier. All these preparations point to the fact that Richard cared what happened to his realm, England included, and did not simply rush off to the crusade post-coronation money in hand. Nevertheless, on July 4th, 1190, simultaneously departing at the same time as his rival, Philip Augustus, he departed for the Holy Land on the Third Crusade to attempt to acquire the glory he had long dreamed of. In addition to Philip Augustus, Frederick I, Holy Roman Emperor known as Barbarossa, also answered the Pope's call to crusade and was seen as a major ally to Richard and Philip. These three allied kings partaking in the crusade would be where the term King's Crusade derived its meaning. However, Frederick would die shortly after the departure for the crusade commenced, leaving Richard and Philip as the main leaders. It quickly became clear that Richard was the military power behind the crusade. His prior ability to raise funds made his army significantly larger and more well-off than his French quasi-ally. It was estimated that Richard's fleet included approximately 200 ships carrying 17,000 soldiers, whereas Philip's fleet was a mere six ships carrying 2,000 men. However, this can never be fully confirmed and may very well be an exaggeration. The crusade started with a trip to Sicily after King William II of Sicily died and the throne was seized by his illegitimate cousin, Tancred. The deceased King William's wife was Richard's sister, Joan, who was imprisoned by Tancred following her husband's death. Her dower also had not been paid, and Richard demanded she be released and her dower distributed to her. Eventually, a treaty would be signed where Joan was released, her dower given, and Richard's three-year-old nephew, Arthur, son of his late brother Joffrey, Duke of Brittany, would be promised to one of Tancred's daughters. Tensions began to rise between the two kings, Richard and Philip, at this point. Richard was betrothed to Philip's sister, Alice, but was disinterested in her and, in fact, wished to marry a woman named Berengaria of Navarre. A settlement was reached between the men, which saw the end of his betrothal to Philip's sister, and the two set sail separately for Accra in the Holy Land. Along the way in 1191, Richard was said to have encountered bad weather, and part of his fleet was shipwrecked or forced to anchor off the south coast of the island of Cyprus. Survivors had been taken prisoner by the island's ruler, Isaac Komnenos. Isaac refused to release the prisoners and the loot he had plundered, with Richard eventually attacking and defeating Isaac, conquering the island in its entirety. The island of Cyprus would eventually be sold and would remain in Christian hands for centuries, becoming a strategic stronghold and supply line for subsequent crusades. Richard married Berengaria in May of that year on Cyprus, adding the Kingdom of Navarre, a part of modern-day Spain, to his indirect influence. He then turned his attention to the port city of Accra. The then king of Jerusalem, Guy of Lusignan, a Poitivan knight who had married into the position, had already been waging a two-year siege at Accra after the port city had fallen to Saladin. Philip would land at Accra first and began to reinforce the battle-weary besiegers and began to construct siege machines. Although progress was made by Philip, the true momentum change came with Richard's landing on June 8, 1191. The addition of Richard's siege machines to Philip's made for a constant barrage of missiles being hurled at the Muslim defenses. Saladin many times attempted to counterattack, but was beaten back time and time again. At that point, Richard would unfortunately fall ill with a sickness called Arnaldia, an affliction similar to scurvy. This would leave Richard confined to his bed for a time. Although Saladin and Richard were both leaders of great warring armies, they were said to have a great degree of mutual respect for one another, and Saladin was said to have sent his own doctor to offer care to Richard during this time. Eventually, Accra would be breached, and by July 12, 1191, Accra was surrendered to the Christian army. Around 3,000 Muslim prisoners were taken at Accra, and Richard demanded large sums of money along with Christian relics and prisoners taken by Saladin when he had previously conquered the Holy Land in exchange for these prisoners. Saladin was given one month to meet these demands, and either not being able to meet the demands within the time frame, or intentionally dragging his feet on the matter, Saladin did not meet the requirements before the deadline. 
Also, Philip suddenly declared that he would return to Europe, leaving the weight of the campaign solely on Richard's shoulders. With Philip leaving, Richard most likely felt the need to push the campaign on to prevent Philip from wreaking havoc on his lands back home. After the deadline passed, with Saladin not complying, Richard wasted no time in dealing with the matter and ordered his men to execute all 3,000 of the Muslim prisoners in cold blood, undoubtedly one of the worst atrocities attributed to Richard during his reign. At this point, Richard decided to push on to Palestine towards Jerusalem. He opted methodically to march his troops close to the coast, maintaining strict speed and formation, while simultaneously having Christian ships shadow their movement from the sea. The army was counterattacked many times by Saladin's forces, but were able to hold strong on their journey. However, in September, part of his forces wavered, not through fear or cowardice, but by the desire to strike and attack the enemy. Holding formation was paramount for his marching strategy to work, but on that day his rear guard broke rank and started an attack on Saladin's forces. Richard, upon seeing this, wasted no time in committing his forces into the conflict, riding ravenously into the Muslim horde. It was said that Richard himself was seen killing swaths of Muslim warriors. Although this is most likely an exaggeration, Richard was definitely a brave warrior and his presence was felt by both his and Saladin's army. This conflict would be known as the Battle of Arsuf, and although Richard prevented part of his army from being overrun and destroyed, it was far from a decisive victory. Richard's army reached Jaffa on the 10th of September and set up a garrison there. With a stalemate being reached and the prospect of conquering Jerusalem dwindling, Richard returned to Acre to plan his next moves. Saladin got word of Richard's departure and attacked Jaffa, breaching the walls and forcing the Christian garrison into the citadel. Richard, upon hearing of this attack, sailed immediately back to Jaffa to relieve his garrison. It was said that he fought from the beaches to the city, setting up a perimeter in order to give his men a chance to rebuild the walls, fighting off attack after attack. The confrontation at Jaffa would end up being the final battle in regards to the crusade, other than small raiding sorties that attacked into Muslim-held territory. Richard and the Christian army attempted to reach Jerusalem twice, coming within 12 miles of the holy city, but Saladin had implemented a scorched earth policy on the road from Jaffa to Jerusalem, destroying strongholds and towns along the way. Richard was forced to retreat twice, greatly affecting the morale of the troops. Eventually, a treaty would be signed at Jaffa on September 2, 1192, putting an end to the Third Crusade, a decision that is questioned by some today. The treaty left Jerusalem in Muslim hands, but guaranteed safe passage for any Christian pilgrims wishing to visit the Holy Land. This meant that although Richard had fought bravely and vigorously in his pursuit to retake Jerusalem, in the end this had ended in failure. Muslim chronicles showed that Saladin was perhaps at a breaking point with his army fracturing and he himself intended to vacate Jerusalem before treaty talks began. But even if Richard were to have taken Jerusalem, the chances that he would have been able to hold on to it were slim, and it would most likely have required him to stay there indefinitely, something that he could not afford to do due to the fact that there were more pressing issues at hand, those of course being the issues back home, orchestrated by none other than Philip Augustus and his brother John. After departing the Holy Land on October 9, 1192, Richard decided not to retrace his steps back to Europe. Philip Augustus had been working hard to tarnish Richard's reputation, and Richard felt that he should bring the least amount of attention to himself on his return trip as possible. Instead of continuing to Sicily and then modern-day southern France, he chose to head north up the Adriatic Sea in an attempt to link up with his brother-in-law, Henry the Lion, who was Duke of Saxony and Bavaria. A storm forced him to make landfall near Venice, and he was forced to travel through Austria. The Duke of Austria was Leopold V, known as the Virtuous. He had taken part in the first parts of the crusade, assisting in the capture of Acre. When the flags of Richard and Philip Augustus were raised over Acre, Duke Leopold attempted to raise his flag along with the victorious kings. Seeing Leopold as a mere duke and not worthy of such an honor, Richard had Leopold's flag ripped down, thrown into the mud, and trampled on. Humiliated and infuriated at Richard's insult, Duke Leopold immediately left Acre and returned home to Austria. Now, in 1192, upon learning of Richard's whereabouts, Leopold set out to capture him. 
Richard was forced to disguise himself as a commoner and travel with a small contingent of close supporters to avoid detection. However, in December of 1192, his luck ran out and he was caught near Vienna with his jewel-encrusted ring giving away his identity. He was taken prisoner and moved to Dernstein Castle with Leopold eventually handing him over to Emperor Henry VI of Germany, who had recently forged an alliance with Philip Augustus. At this point, Richard's kingdom began to fall apart. His brother John sided with Philip Augustus and looked to seize the crown of England for himself. John paid homage to Philip and granted Philip the right to seize large amounts of lands in strategic castles in Anjou, Normandy, and the Vexen. Philip in return was to assist John in his attempt to usurp the throne, but in reality did little to help John. Richard and John's mother, Eleanor, put an end to this and stopped John's attempt to seize the crown, forcing him to return to Mortain. Eventually, an agreement was brokered by Eleanor and Richard's initial chief justiciar, William Longchamp, where a ransom of 150,000 marks would be paid for Richard's freedom. It should be noted that Longchamp had been deposed of his position as chief justiciar by that point after questionable rule while Richard was on crusade. Richard was freed in February of 1194 and set out to regain the lands lost during his 18-month captivity. He started in England, clearing out any that were still loyal to his brother John, starting with the castle at Nottingham. Although this seems to fall right in line with the story of Robin Hood, in reality the story of Robin Hood did not start to be associated with Richard's reign until much later, around the 15th century, and there is no evidence to support that Robin Hood, if he even existed, was alive during Richard's reign. After securing England, Richard began the process of preparing for the trip to the continent to contest Philip Augustus and regain what was lost in his absence. Little did he know that unfortunately for him, this would be the last time he would ever see England. Richard landed at Balfreu and immediately started achieving success in recapturing lands from Philip. John, still allied with Philip at this time, was charged with holding the castle at Evreux. However, instead, John met Richard at Lisieux, begging for forgiveness from his older brother. Despite the fact that John had audaciously and aggressively attempted to usurp the crown and had been the driving factor behind the seating of Richard's lands on the continent, Richard did not punish John for his betrayal. In fact, other than having his land stripped, John was free to serve in Richard's army, Richard seeing John as a helpless fool. Richard would go on to deliver defeat after defeat to Philip, almost capturing him multiple times and reconquering almost all the lands that were lost. However, in 1199, Richard traveled to Aquitaine to deal with unrest. He laid siege to the castle of Chalou, a small and strategically unimportant stronghold in the grand scheme. The castle quickly began to falter and was near submission when Richard decided to survey the progress, riding unarmored up to the battle lines. A lone crossbowman loosed an arrow towards him, striking Richard in the left shoulder. It is believed that the surgeon was unable to initially remove the bolt, leading to a gangrenous infection. At that time, gangrene was all but a death sentence, and it was immediately known that there was no hope for Richard's recovery. After it was apparent that he would die, he requested that the archer Bertrand de Gourdon, who had been captured at that point, be brought to him. Some claim Bertrand was merely a boy, and Richard forgave him and sent him away with money, but he was nevertheless recaptured and flayed alive. On April 6th, 1199, after declaring his younger brother John as heir, Richard the Lionheart, King of England, died at 41 years of age, reportedly in the arms of his mother. His heart was removed, embalmed, and buried at Rouen Cathedral, with his body being transported to be buried beside his father's at Fontevraud Abbey, near the Loire. His mother would soon join them at Fontevraud, along with one of John's wives, Isabella of Angoulême. As is the case with many English monarchs, his body, along with those of his father and mother, were destroyed or lost, most likely sometime around the French Revolution. However, Fontevraud Abbey still exists, and Richard's, along with his father's and mother's tomb effigy, can be seen to this day. The tomb containing his heart is also intact and can be seen at the cathedral at Rouen. Richard's reign is a difficult one to analyze. There were no doubt many factors and influences at play when looking upon his past. 
His direct commitment to the crusade leads some to believe that much of his reign was exaggerated with churchmen quick to give glory to those who supported their endeavors. But his ferocity and military success cannot be ignored. He was no doubt a well-documented, successful, and courageous fighter in the eyes of many, including laymen and his opposition. Although bravery and chivalry have become synonymous with Richard, and he has become a revered legend throughout the centuries, there are most certainly a list of absolute criticisms of Richard. His massacre of 3,000 captive Muslims at Accra is obviously seen as a despicable act from a modern viewpoint, but also, when viewed from a historical standpoint, went against his chivalric values that he was claimed to be so much a champion of in his time. His alleged desire for glory is understood as leading to questionable if not downright foolish decisions, putting men and objectives at risk and eventually leading to his premature death. Also, the main source of glory from which Richard pulls his fame, the Crusade, was ultimately a failure, with Jerusalem not being conquered. Perhaps the greatest criticism that could be placed at Richard's feet was the nomination of his brother John as successor after all that had transpired leading up to his death. His nephew Arthur, son of John's elder brother Joffrey, was alive and well, but Richard still chose his traitorous brother as heir, which would, in the end, have disastrous consequences for England and his Angevin empire as a whole. In the end, the truth behind Richard most likely lives somewhere between all the glorifications and criticisms. He did make what would seem to be questionable decisions, and was not technically successful in his crusade aspirations and spent little time in England. But he was a respected, battle-tested, and successful military leader, perhaps socially forced into the crusade, who took great care to see that his realms, including England, were in order in his absence. Whatever one may believe, Richard has no doubt had an impact on history, if not primarily from a mythical viewpoint. He worked vigorously to develop and maintain his mythical and glorious reputation, and it seems, at least for now, to have been successful, for even today he is still remembered as Richard the Lionheart. <laughs>